Well, I'm completely wired here, so if I, something happens and I get shocked, I apologize. Um, I, I really am delighted to have an opportunity to, to talk about um, what I see as healthcare reform, <clears throat> which is sort of like getting in front of an audience and saying you're going to talk about politics or religion, which are the two things you should never do. Um, but the twist um, Christine alluded to is what I really want to talk about is what's wrong with health care um, and less about kind of insurance reform, which is where I think a lot of the dialogue has been. And I don't know that everyone's really aware of these statistics, um, but they're pretty ominous. So if you measure the quality of health care in the United States objectively, infant mortality rates, cancer death rates, longevity, likelihood of MI, all the things that you can measure, the United States is 37th. So, <clears throat> you know the movie Sicko, Michael Moore? He said Cuba was better than us. Well, he was wrong. Cuba is 38th. <laughs> if that makes you feel any better. Um, where we are leading is in cost. And um, we're actually not first in cost. We're second. The number one in cost is the Marshall Islands, and that's where we tested the nuclear bomb during World War II. So I think, you know, this is kind of one of those Houston, we have a problem moments. We ought to be able to do a lot better than we're doing. This just shows it graphically that <clears throat> the United States spends close to $8,000 per person on health care relative to a pool of developed countries that all objectively measure better than us in terms of the health of their citizens, we spend twice as much. And um, so we're not getting our return on our investment in how we're, how we're managing health care in this country. I, um, I can separate that into kind of three categories. One is we pay people more, we charge more for devices, we charge more for drugs, so there's that bucket. Then there's a middle bucket that's kind of the friction in the system. We have insurance companies in the middle, and that they have to make money too. So all of the frictional aspects of our healthcare system are another cost. Then a third, which is the biggest bucket, is really how are we delivering care? It's the quality piece. And I actually think $1,500 is an underestimate. We, we have enormous potential. Even if we don't make progress in the top two, which I hope we do, in the bottom piece, overuse of testing, underuse of the best protocols for care that cost us an enormous amount of money and also have a dramatic impact on your health outcomes, which in the, at the end is what it's supposed to be about. <clears throat> now I'm going to take drugs as an example. And um, this is us, right? So most people think that if I prescribe a medication to you, that this is what the outcome looks like. All the people in green have a good outcome. There are a few people over here on the left that the drug doesn't do anything for. And there's one poor, unfortunate guy over here on the right that has a side effect. That's the general public's perception of drug therapy. It turns out to be completely wrong. Yes, there are some antibiotics that work this way, but the vast majority of drugs that we prescribe for you look like this. There are a few people up on the top right that the drug's really helping the most. There are a bunch of people in the lighter green that are getting some modest benefit there are a whole bunch of people getting no benefit, and then there are different people being harmed in different ways. And that's really what it looks like for virtually all drugs now used. And so why is that? And what can we do about that? And that's where the opportunity lies. That's both the problem and the opportunity, because we're entering an era where we can do something about that. Just to kind of give you a sense of the magnitude of this problem. If you just look at the drug's side effects causing death in hospitals, it's 125,000 people a year 
die of adverse drug effects in, an, in the nation's hospitals. So <clears throat> if you, that's like a 740, <clears throat> excuse me, that's like a 747 crashing every single day. If a 747 crashed every single day, that'd probably get on the news, right? <laughs> but why doesn't this get on the news? Because there are 8,000 hospitals in the United States. So averaged across all those hospitals, those 125,000 people, it's just a few people each year in each hospital. Flies under the radar screen. But it's an enormous problem, and this is only the people that are harmed. 10 to 20x more are getting the medications and are not getting any benefit. So how can, you know, if you think about that issue and the potential for improvement, you know, you start to kind of get a, a glimmer of, oh my gosh, we're spending all this time worrying about insurance reform. Couldn't we do a whole lot better to job delivering care? And wouldn't there be an enormous uh, potential for that? <clears throat> These are some of the re leading concepts in what I would call real health care reform. And it's drawn as a pyramid. And you, you see these terms used in magazine articles you read or, or news reports. Condition-focused care or value-based care is changing the healthcare system so that every time you come to the doctor or you go to the hospital to have an appendectomy, we don't charge you for, you know, walking through the doorway, <laughs> wheeling yourself into the operating room. You know, each suture costs this much. Instead, <clears throat> if you have high blood pressure, the healthcare system gets paid to take care of you for five years. Completely different way of thinking about how to pay for healthcare. And the healthcare system would be incented not just to do less or do more, but based on measures of how well you do. What a concept, right? So <clears throat> the other is the medical home, which is not managed care. It's all the different things that you need as a patient delivered to you when you need them, where you need them, so you can actually access them. And I'm going to show you what I mean by that. And then personalized evidence-based care is, you know, I showed you the picture of all the people that were sort of helped by the drugs. Evidence-based care says, on average, this is the best drug for you. But if there are 100 people in the room and the best drug only helps 20, what about the other 80? Personalized evidence-based care addresses not just the 20, but the other 80. And all that sits on a platform of healthcare information technology. <clears throat> The IT systems at Federal Express that deliver your packages to your home are vastly more sophisticated than are used in hospitals. That's crazy. You know, I mean, we're dealing with real with lives in hospitals. <clears throat> healthcare is an information business. To deliver the best healthcare to you at any given moment, I need information. I need everything there is to know about you at my fingertips when I need it, so I can decide what to do. And I also need decision support saying, based on all this information, here are some things you need to think about. That's what real healthcare information technology should do in the process of care. And the vast majority of the nation's hospitals, 98% are still on paper. They're writing orders, they're writing notes. It's like it was 50 years ago. So there's a huge opportunity and improvement just for getting the technology that we use to deliver packages in our hospitals. And all the rest of that, what I've described depend on that happening because we'll get nowhere unless we can manage information. So I, I do think that universities have a real role to play in all of this. And Vanderbilt has some real strategic advantages in moving <coughs> what I consider to be a, a health reform agenda forward. First of all, if you think about it, um, 
There are very few academic health centers that are fully integrated where the university and the medical center and the hospitals and the clinics and the doctors are all one. We're one integrated corporate entity with one board. And so we're all aligned. Think of it this way, if you ran a company, and this is the way private health care looks throughout most of this country, if you ran a company with a thousand souls working for that company, and they were all subcontractors who didn't actually work for you, that's what healthcare looks like. Universities, and some universities are a little bit different, and when you hear in the news different politicians saying, well, it's different at the Mayo Clinic and it's different at the Cleveland Clinic, what they mean is those places are operating as a single integrated corporate entity, and so the hospital and the doctors and the administrators at least have the potential to be aligned when they want to change something or they want to improve a care protocol or do something differently. So we think that healthcare will gradually migrate more and more to fully integrated systems where everybody's singing off the same dance sheet. It's sort of like trying to conduct an orchestra with the first chair violinist off doing something else while the drummer's over here. We really need an integration within our healthcare systems to get everybody working together. Um, <clears throat> there are other things that really help us. The fact that Vanderbilt Medical Center is actually on the university campus, I find tremendously helpful because what I find is any time we're trying to do something hard, the discipline expertise that I need to move that forward actually isn't in the medical center. It's in the law school. It's in the business school. It's in the engineering program. And that interdisciplinary interface that we have because we're all co-located really helps us innovate and find new solutions and I'm going to show you what a little of that what those look like in just a minute and then the last piece is informatics and I mentioned how important information technology is and we began investing in biomedical informatics about a dozen years ago um, back when it really wasn't even popular and Vanderbilt now um, really is the nation's leader in healthcare information technology. Um, the last two presidential administrations have used us to help um, plan their healthcare IT efforts. And we have something like 80 faculty in a department of biomedical informatics that's more than twice as large as any program in the, in the country. Practically all the bi PhD biomedical informaticians in the country work for us, and nobody can hire one. And I just love that. Um, I want to say a little bit about the medical home. <clears throat> Has anybody been to Hundred Oaks lately? Okay, so this is one of our experiments with the medical home, and it was a different concept in healthcare. It was the brainchild of a guy named Wright Pinson, who's the CEO of our hospital and clinics area, and Wright had this idea that you really ought to be able to make a welcoming environment where people would want to be and where it would be easy to access for outpatient health care. And so that's what we've tried to create at 100 Oaks. When you come there, a couple of things happen. Um, you slide your clinic card through a machine and then everything about your health information is transmitted to the doctors and nurses and you don't have to fill out a bunch of forms. And the other thing we do is we hand you a beeper because if, you're, if we're not quite ready for you, we want to page you so that you can go shopping and you can do a number of things at 100 Oaks. You can get a dog. <laughs> you could get a BMW. You could go to the movies. Um, so, um, so it's a different approach. And one of the things we're finding, and one of the, I get an email all the time, and I get email mostly about parking. And people really like the parking at 100 Oaks. And they say, it's so much better than over on, at Vanderbilt. I have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> We also, you know, have found access actually changes health outcomes. So I have emails from women who come to the breast center at 100 Oaks where you can actually get a mammogram without an appointment. You can just drop by after work or drop by on your lunch hour. <laughs> and we've picked up tumors. And people have said, you know, if it wasn't easy to park and it wasn't so convenient, I never would have gone. So I really think that makes very real what 
real convenient access means for health care prevention, which is where all the money is. If you make health care so easy for people to get that they just can't help themselves but use it, great things happen. It shouldn't be that I have to plan for six months to go see my doctor and wait 45 minutes in the waiting room. That's not going to work in the future. It's inefficient, it's expensive, and it's not working. So shopping malls are one, one option. Another is the web. And, um, all, and all patients at Vanderbilt now, if you're a clinic patient or you have any kind of Vanderbilt um, health care, you can sign up for My Health at Vanderbilt, which gives you your own personal web portal. And you can interact directly with your physician through your personalized web portal. You can look up your tests. So if you come in and have your cholesterol checked, when you get home, you can pull up the value on your own web portal. You can see the drugs you're on, and you can edit those and make sure the list is updated. And this business of being able to interact with your physician by email through the web portal, people love this because if you just need a simple answer, I'd, I'd I, I'm having some side effects, I think I just need to drop the dose of this medication a little bit, would that be okay? You get an answer that day. And the nurse practitioners often are screening these emails and talking with the physicians and saying, you know, Mrs. Jones would like to know if it's okay and they'll answer. Or sometimes the doctors will answer directly at the end of the day. And people ask me, well, don't the doctors go nuts getting all this email? And, they, and the fact is, the doctors are having to make phone calls right now. And imagine what it's like to track me down. If all the doctor needs to do is answer your email or send you a communication through the portal, it totally, totally changes the communication stream so that doctors and patients are really interacting freely. So people, you don't have to do this. People sign up for it. We have over 125,000 of our patients now using this system. It increases at about 25,000 patients a year. We get 8,000 hits a day. People are voting with their feet. They love this. People like to control their health care. They like to be able to control how they're interacting with the health care system. We're, act, we're starting to advertise clinical trials to people, but just the ones that make sense based on their health care history, if they wish to participate. There's all kinds of potential for using the web to create another way that patients can easily access health care. So this is my health at Vanderbilt, and I think we'll be just doing more and more with that. I now want to tell you a little bit about kind of a, how, how we can use healthcare information technology um, to do something extraordinary with quality, and at the same time, save a lot of money. So I think people sometimes think that if we do things to save money in healthcare, we're going to cut quality. And I think that's sort of... Um, you know, Neanderthal thinking. I think what we want is real substantial improvements in quality that as a consequence reduce cost. That's where we want to be. So <clears throat> let's just take one example. There's this thing called ventilator acquired pneumonia. So if you are unfortunate enough to be in an intensive care unit sometime during your life, um, you'll likely have a breathing tube in. You'll be breathing on a ventilator. We have at any, on any given time four or five hundred people over at Vanderbilt on ventilators. <clears throat> Your biggest risks of not surviving is pneumonia because when you have that breathing tube in, all the normal defenses that protect your lungs are bypassed. So there are seven things that we know that if they get done all the time at the right time, dramatically reduce the chances that you'll get pneumonia. And there are good data that show that all seven of these things need to happen and how often they need to happen, and the data are unambiguous. <clears throat> A lot of the data were produced at Vanderbilt. And um, the problem is, is have you ever been in an intensive care unit? It's like O'Hare Airport. <laughs> there are doctors all over the place, you might have 10 different nurses during the day, you've got respiratory therapists, you've got all these people all running around doing the best they can to try to take care of you, but 
it's not hard to imagine that every now and then something might get missed or forgotten because it's organized chaos. So how do we change that? How do we hardwire the system so that everything always happens? And so um, what we did was we created a screensaver. So um, it's not enough for the nurses and doctors to enter into the computer that they remembered to put the bed up at 30 degrees or they remembered to clean out the mouth. We need to have that information displayed to everybody taking care of the patient so they know it's happened or they know it hasn't happened. So what this screensaver does is it indicates for each patient in each bed which of those things have happened. So the, the, the green, red, yellow is green it's been done, red it hasn't been done, yellow it sort of needs to be done because it's starting to get late. So the beautiful thing is this, these computer screens are all over the ICU. There are huge screens in front of the nurse's station, and the families can see the screens. <laughs> Wonder what that looks like. <laughs> um, excuse me, why hasn't my husband... Yeah, well, so, let me show you what happened when we did this. So, <clears throat> so this was when we started in 2005, and we were having a roughly 300, 320 ventilator-acquired pneumonias per year in our ICUs. <clears throat> According to the national data, we were excellent. We didn't have a problem. We were better than everybody else, or better than most places. It wasn't an issue. But everybody said, well, how could that be? Because we know we're not doing very well. Um, so we implemented first, the evidence-based order sets, okay, without the screensaver that just said these are the seven things everybody must do. So everybody kind of knew what they needed to do and we saw a little bit of improvement. It got down to 250. Then we implemented the screensaver and it dropped to about 100 a year. So the annual cost savings, well you can see the number of ventilator acquired pneumonias prevented, 100 in a year, 16 deaths avoided, four and a half million dollars per year saved. <clears throat> so Vanderbilt is one-tenth of one percent of the hospital beds in the United States. So take this and multiply by a thousand and you get the impact if everybody did this. So that's 4.3 billion. That's a lot of money. Not to mention the lives saved, right? 4.3 billion. Now think about the fact that before we had this conversation, in unless you happen to work in healthcare, you'd probably never heard of ventilator-acquired pneumonia. Think about applying this kind of process support to everything we do in healthcare. Outpatient care, high blood pressure management, all the different things we do and do not very well. Multiplied by a thousand again. Conservatively multiplied by a thousand again. That's four and a half trillion. I think we just paid for health care reform. So, so, that's, so that's where the money is. And that's why I, a lot of us are trying to move the discussion away from just insurance reform to actually reforming the way health care is delivered. Because there's an enormous potential for impact. <clears throat> Okay, so um, what does that do to kind of a really hard measure of outcome? And that is, if you come to the hospital, how likely is it that you get to go home? What we call that is observed, the, the, the euphemism for that is what we call observed to expected mortality. So if you have disease X, we know the statistical likelihood that you will survive and leave the hospital ahead of time. That shouldn't surprise you. It's based on national num norms, thousands of patients that have this constellation of, of symptoms. On average, if you come to the hospital with this, the chances you'll survive and leave alive are X. If you look at that across all diseases and all admissions, 1.0 is average and it's average for university hospitals in this country. 
which are among the best performing. So if you're below 1.0, you're better than average. And Vanderbilt back in 2005, it's hard to read this, but this is December of 2005, was around 0.9. And you can see our trend coming up into 2010. We've been moving this number down, 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 down. So now we're at around 0.7, and we're trying to get to 0.65. And what that says is that, what does it really say? What it says is that if we're at 0.7, that 428 people lived because they came to Vanderbilt and didn't go to the average university hospital in this country. So those are real numbers. 428 people is more than the number of people that fly on a 747. <clears throat> If we get the number, just to make this real for you, if we get the number down to 0.65, that would be 500 patients. If you look at the U.S. News best hospitals, you see that thing in U.S. News and World Report? <clears throat> Vanderbilt, when it was at 0.75 last year, was fourth. We're going to get to number one because I've told everybody we're going to get to number one. Um, <laughs> And, but that's what, that's what this means. That's what all of this process means, is, is getting these numbers down, but getting to the point where you're actually saving lives and people are walking out of the hospital who wouldn't otherwise. And it's these complicated systems issues that actually have a big impact on that. Whether somebody remembered to brush somebody's teeth in the intensive care unit and had the bed at 30 degrees across hundreds of patients determines how likely people are to do well. So that's system-based care. <clears throat> that's getting the system right. Let me tell you then what personalization of care looks like on top of having a good system of care. So, so just to bring you back, personalization of care means we're all different. And I love this picture because it kind of shows the diversity of the human condition. And, um, if you just go back to the drug analogy, if these two little girls both have cancer, the likelihood is if they have the same cancer and they get the same chemotherapy, it'll work for one and not for the other one. Even though it's, on average, the best one that the literature says should be used. Why? Because they have genetic differences. If you look at this gentleman over here who has depression, what we know is that a third of the time the first drug works, two-thirds of the time it doesn't work. And it's not until they get to the third drug that the chances are nine out of ten they're on one that works. Depression is pervasive in our society. And the chances that someone will commit suicide while we're diddling around trying to get to the right drug go up twentyfold. This gentleman <coughs> takes an aspirin a day, a baby aspirin a day, for prevention of stroke. Lots of people do that, right? Unfortunately, nearly half of the time, it doesn't work. The problem is, we don't know which half. Wish we could tell you. It's in your DNA sequence. So, we're all different and we all have a different genetic makeup and that has an extraordinary impact on how effective all the different kinds of therapies are that we deliver in healthcare. <clears throat> so we've been attacking this in a number of different ways. One is through a program that you might have heard about called BioView, which is Vanderbilt's DNA bank. And we have been collecting DNA now for a little over three years with, a, with an effort to really build the library of information that's needed so that we know if you have this DNA sequence, then you should get this drug, not this drug. Because no place, not the NIH, not Harvard, not Johns Hopkins, no place has this information. It's not like it's out there and, and we're just not using it. We didn't even know because no one had collected enough DNA and linked it to healthcare information from a comprehensive electronic health record like we have to figure it out. 
That's what BioView is. And right here in Nashville, Tennessee, now is the nation's largest DNA resource for trying to understand what the DNA sequence means and how it should be used to give you the right drug. We're at a, we actually are going to hit 100,000 samples sometime in November. We're going to have a little party, 100,000 sample party. Um, <laughs> We're very excited about it because when we started this, it was so it was like trying to start the Manhattan Project, and um, we really think it's going to have an enormous impact on the health of people here in Nashville as well as all over the country. You can see this little map over here. These are the five centers that are participating in this pro in a project in projects like this that are also supported by the National Institutes of Health. Vanderbilt down there with 85,000 samples, that was six months ago, is the coordinating center, the national coordinating center for this NIH supported effort to kind of marry the information from electronic health records to DNA to try to figure out what it means. And of course, all this information is de-identified, so we strip away all identifiers so that we don't even know who, these, who the patients are. It's just the diseases and the drug effects. Um, there are other centers, and I'd, I'd just like to mention that this is um, University of Washington, Seattle. This is the Marshfield Clinic. Um, this is Northwestern. This is the Mayo Clinic. Um, this is Vanderbilt. This is the Mayo Clinic. <laughs> so, um, but I'm not competitive. <laughs> so you may have... Um, so we've actually started to also, in addition to doing all the research to try to figure out what the DNA sequence means, I'm very happy to say that in the last few months we've actually got enough information that we're now able to take that knowledge and move it into care. And there are two ways we're doing that. One is in cancer. And, and you might have seen, if you were up at 6 o'clock in the morning about a month ago on Sanjay Gupta, um, about a five-minute segment on Pam Coffey. Um, what we've done is, for every patient that has melanoma, which as you know is this dreaded skin cancer, we sequence the tumor because we figured out that there are some drugs, there's a class of drugs that if patients have this certain DNA sequence in their tumor, the drug kills the tumor. And it's just amazing. And so Pam Coffey offered to let us profile her on, on Sanjay Gupta. She had been getting routine care for her melanoma and had failed. And she was really starting to decline. And she came to Vanderbilt and Dr. Jeff Sossman sequenced her tumor and we got her on this BRAF inhibitor, which is this drug that attacks tumors. Fortunately, she had the kind and about half of patients have the kind that have the sequence variant, in four days, she's up and around, feeling great, can't believe it. Amazing. So we have this program now in melanoma, we have it in lung cancer, um, and we're about to roll it out for GI cancers like colon cancer. And we're going to try to get this program into every kind of cancer that people have, so that we're not just picking, quote, the best drug on average, but we're actually looking at people's tumors and making a decision about which drug it ought to be based on the DNA of that tumor. <clears throat> the, other, the other way we're attacking this is, I think, um, very novel, and that is trying to address the issue that once you have the information, how, how do you get it to the doctor at the right time? So. <clears throat> Francis Collins, who's the director of the NIH, which took over about a year ago in September 2009, had this to say. He said, the limiting factor right now is that oftentimes if you're ready to write a prescription, you don't want to wait a week to find out the DNA sequence to decide what to do. Patient's here, patient needs care, patient needs a prescription. Patient's in the hospital, patient, you know, we got to do, what, we got to do something here. We don't have a week. How do we get the DNA information into the hands of the doctor with the right decision support to do the right thing. So because the, he was the NIH director, we figured, well, we ought to solve that problem, right? So um, 
This week at Vanderbilt, we started. And um, we started with patients who are having cardiac catheterization, heart patients. So Vanderbilt does 4,000 cardiac catheterizations a year. And 1,700 of those 4,000 patients will leave the cath lab with what's called a stent, which is kind of a little pipe that they put in the coronary vessel to keep it open. Now when they do that, they put patients almost universally on a drug called Plavix. You've probably heard of Plavix. It's in the news all the time. <clears throat> Plavix is great except for the 50 patients for whom it doesn't work. And we actually know now what DNA variant says it won't work. So what do you do? Well, what we've started doing is every patient, as they're coming to the cath lab, three or four days before they'd even get Plavix, we're sequencing their DNA. And we're identifying whether or not they have this mutation. And so if the cardiologist puts in a stent, and then if the cardiologist orders Plavix, and they're one of those 50 patients. When, they doc, when the cardiologist orders the Plavix, that red box pops up and tells them, no, don't do that. Give them the other drug. That's pretty extraordinary, actually. That's never happened before, anywhere. And the cool thing is that, <clears throat> you know, these patients, if you're one of those 50 patients, and the Plavix doesn't work for you, one of two things happen. Either you, your stent clots off slowly and you're back in and you have to have about a $100,000 procedure to take care of the problem, or you drop dead suddenly. And it happens every single day. So this is a big deal. And it's not just the Plavix. So when we sequence your DNA, we don't just sequence it at the Plavix gene. We sequence it at 250 other sites that we know are critical for determining drug therapy. If I look at Vanderbilt patients over their lifetime, 50% of patients that come to Vanderbilt over their lifetime have some kind of treatment where the genetic sequence would have mattered in terms of what we do at least once and 20% of the time, four times in their lifetime. So this, is, this kind of care is gonna impact vast numbers of people. And when we sequence the DNA for the cardiac patient, when they come back three years from now and they have high blood pressure and the, and the internist prescribes a antihypertensive, another red box will come up and it'll say, we sequenced this patient's DNA three years ago and it says they shouldn't have that antihypertensive. And then when they come back two years later and, they're, and they have pneumonia and we prescribe an antibiotic, the red box comes up again and says, no, 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 they, they should have this antibiotic. So, but that DNA was sequenced five years ago. Guess what? Your DNA sequence never changes. It's a beautiful thing. So once we do this once, we're done. And that's why it's so cost effective. This is what I think healthcare looks like in the future. Um, I think it's a dramatic change. I think we're right in the middle of it. It's happening around you as we speak. You're going to see more and more and more of this <coughs> happening. Um, right now it's happening um, in hospitals. More and more you're going to start to experience in your outpatient care, genetic guided therapy. And um, I'm just delighted that we're kind of front and center in all this because it's very exciting and I think it's going to have a big impact. You're going to see um, a change, you might have already seen it, um, in Vanderbilt's messaging. We had this thing called Hearts and Minds. We only had it for 13 years. I think it was, it was time to do something else. Um, so we have a new campaign that's called The Promise of Discovery. And you're going to see ads on the local news um, that just talk a little bit about what discovery is, means and how that's changing the way we care for patients. 
Um, because that's really what Vanderbilt's all about is delivering health care, but delivering it in a way that really leverages all the benefits of having an enormous discovery enterprise in our midst. And um, you're also going to see us when you watch the national news, because we're going to be running segments on CNN headline news um, that talk about these things. Um, we're doing that for a number of reasons. We actually think it's really important that people across the country know what's going on in Nashville. And we also, you know, we have 25,000 people working over there on 21st Avenue, and it really makes them proud when they see that the things we're doing that they're a part of are reaching the entire country. And so we're doing it for them too. And we wanted you to know about it. So thank you for having me. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Right, so um, about $250 right now. Um, now, that's because we are at scale where we're doing lots of DNA sequencing, right? Um, so, so and, and the other thing is people always, the next question is who's paying for that? Um, right now we are. We see this as a pilot project. And what we want to do is do this in about 17,000 people um, and get some really compelling outcome data that show the payers that, you know, it's in their best interest to cover this. Because, frankly, the cost reduction when you, if, if you have a patient who avoids a $100,000 admission, you know, that doesn't take the payers very long to figure that out. So, we're running this as a pilot project where we're funding it for a while because we know we're going to collect data that shows the federal payers as well as the private payers that this is something they ought to cover. Um, so it's a good investment on our part. Yeah. Um, so interestingly, there's practically no pushback. There's, um, this will really stun you, administrative snags and um, a complete lack of ability to operationalize. So the key, the key things you need to do this are, one, you need an integrated health system, <coughs> right, where you can actually deliver decision support to all the healthcare providers in your system. And you need electronic, an electronic health system that supports that so that everybody's ordering things off of a system where all the health information is coming into the system and it's all, it's all kind of supported um, in, a, in a way that if I'm a nurse and I'm in the emergency room, I can pull up the patient's information and know what to do. And so few hospitals in this country have that. That's the real barrier to getting not just genetically guided prescription and drug ordering and test ordering, but anything guided drug ordering, test ordering. Because frankly, we're doing this before we started the DNA project, basically saying to everybody, look, the evidence is if this patient has this pneumonia, this is the drug they should get, right? And most places, if you look, there's this amazing statistic. If you look nationally, if something's published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is the Bible, right, for what should be done in healthcare, as absolutely the right thing to do in this condition, it takes seven years before half the physicians in this country do that. Now, doctors are not stupid. This isn't lack of intelligence. 
And it's also not obstinacy. It's they don't know. And the decision support they need, you know, there's no way any physician can remember everything. So it's the issue in healthcare is getting the right information out of this massive pool of knowledge to the right patient at the right time to the right provider. That's the challenge. And that's how having intelligent decision support in our health systems is really the critical linchpin. Are you Great question. So we, so yes, 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 yes. <laughs> um, by virtue of being a Vanderbilt patient, you're given lots of opportunities um, to participate in clinical trials. And then the BioView DNA banking project is something when you come to the Vanderbilt clinic, you opt whether or not you want to be in or not. So what we find is actually 5% of patients who come to Vanderbilt choose not to participate and opt out. Nobody has to be in this. You are completely protected in terms of your identity. So <clears throat> what we do is we take the electronic health record, and every week our bioinformaticians strip out all the personal identifiers. So you go from being Joan Smith to patient X, and you literally cannot tell who the patient is. All the dates are shifted the names of cities, there are all these, and there's a lot of research on this, how you take an electronic health record and de-identify it so nobody can tell who it is. And the people that develop that science actually work at Vanderbilt now. And so we create an anonymous health record that's fictitious patients, and that's what the DNA is linked to. So this is not only extremely secure, but we're doing research and we don't want people's identity at risk even if they've agreed to do this. And so what, what we're doing research on is almost, it's almost like um, that movie, um, Avatars. <laughs> Even though it's your DNA, because we don't want there to be any identification of, your, of, your, of, of you in this process. But everybody's, everybody that's a patient at, at Vanderbilt has an opportunity to participate in that. That said, you won't know, because all we're doing with that information is learning. We're trying to learn more and more and more about which sequences predict which drug or which test. And then once we know that, we come back over here and we say, okay, now we're going to go to the cath lab where we have good information about what we ought to do. And now that is the standard of care. It's wrong to not do this. We're going to let everybody's DNA get sequenced so they can decide whether or not they should get Plavix. So we separate the research from the what is standard of care now that we understand what we need to do with the DNA sequence. Is that? Can't tell who has a microphone now. Hi. So I'm very appreciative of uh, your presentation also. I was reading a book last night by Dr. Joel Furman, huh. who is, um, I guess, thought of somewhat in a the holistic camp of, of doctors, and uh, he's, he's recently partnered with Whole Foods Market Corporation to uh, you know, promote healthy eating and that sort of thing. And I was reading in, in his book a statement that he makes about how fasting from one week to four weeks can totally cure just about any disease. And I know this, you know, the subjects are I'm wondering how this might fit into a reform program. I know it's somewhat theoretical, <laughs> the way that you're thinking. And I know that I like potato chips just like everybody else does. I ate the potato chips and the cookie, so. <laughs> and I just thought that was phenomenal information. I wonder if you have a comment on that. Well, um, what I can comment on is the importance of nutrition. Um, I, I can't comment on Dr. Furman's comment. but. Um, what I can say is that we just did the men's health report card two or three days ago for the state of Tennessee, and a third of the men in the state of Tennessee self-report their obese. Self-report. So that, that means those of us who are willing to admit it. <laughs> so it's probably half. And um, 
the risk of diabetes and heart disease and all the things that we worry about if you're overweight, we know are much higher. So there are very few things that we could do to help ourselves and reduce our health care cost than lose weight. I mean, it has an enormous impact on the likelihood that you'll need health care, expensive health care in the future. Weight control is really one of our biggest challenges in the state of Tennessee. And if you ask me if there's one thing anybody in this room could do to reduce their risk of any major disease, I'd either answer stop smoking or lose weight, not knowing anything about you. No, only, only if you're overweight. There is no evidence that weight loss that I'm aware of that would be published in the journals that I talk about that says you're more healthy if you lose weight if you're already normal weight. What I, and, and I don't want to argue about whether or not that's true or not because I, you know, I, I haven't read the book, but, but what I can tell you for sure is that a huge number of people in the state of Tennessee are overweight and I mean, why not worry about the low-hanging fruit, right? The low-hanging fruit is just all of us that know we need to lose weight. If we lose weight, we're going to be healthier. And that's where I think we ought to focus. My question is, and understanding the insurance world is in the world of blacks and understanding the privacy of clinical research, once it becomes standard of care, how do we see protecting ourselves from the insurance companies? You could say, yeah. we're not going to share your DNA with them, but you would have to think that Blue Cross Blue Shield would have this predictive model that says, gee, if somebody's not given Plavix by Vanderbilt, that means, ooh, you know, their DNA means this. Um, well, good, great question. Um, so first of all, believe it or not, there was a federal law passed about two or three years ago when no one was looking um, that made it illegal for any entity to make a decision about you that's not in your best interest on the basis of your DNA sequence. Federal law. So that was amazing actually. And so we do have a framework of legal protection that pre prevents an insurance company or any other entity um, or, or at least renders consequences if they were to do that. Um, the second thing is it's pretty unlikely that somebody could make the deduction that you're referring to even though it makes sense you'd have to actually know that see because because the things that so, so the thing that tells the insurance company something isn't that you did or didn't get Plavix what they care about is whether or not you had heart disease right because that's the thing that predicts cost so the position of the insurance company is we're going to be glad that you know I would I would rather insure somebody that's getting health care at a place that can use the best possible technologies to lower their risk of an expensive bad outcome so there's actually a positive alignment of incentives around this what I, would, what I would be more worried about is not the health insurance companies so much as other entities taking advantage, you know, and there are books written about this, taking advantage of people based on something genetic, which I doubt would actually come from healthcare centers using DNA to improve care. I suspect that those things will happen through access to people's DNA in other ways, because frankly, you can get somebody's DNA sequence because you just brush up against them, right? So my, my instincts are that the problems, if they do occur, will, become, will, will be through these other much more routine ways of accessing, sort of like stealing somebody's identity. That doesn't happen when you're at, you know, <laughs> at a very highly established entity. It happens when you're in the park buying something at a fair. You know what I mean? So those are the things I, I worry about the most, not whether somebody's DNA will be used as they're getting health care in, in a bad way, even though we, we still take all the precautions. And I know everybody worries about it, and of course we worry about it. What I can also tell you is that um, 
I think people have the impression that because <clears throat> if healthcare information is electronic, then suddenly it's risky. What do you think happens when healthcare information is on paper? <laughs> right? So at least when it's electronic, we can lock it down. We can, you know, we use Defense Department level encryption. Do you think that paper records have Defense Department level encryption? And they're passed around and they're, they're just sitting there. So I, I would argue that places that have moved to having robust electronic health systems are protecting you, not putting you at risk. Even though we all know that for everything we do, there's this baseline layer of risk that we can never take away, not me nor anyone else. And we, all we can do is try to keep pushing the number down. Is that fair? Yeah. Well, well, the feds love it because the fed, uh, and the reason the feds love it is they're a big payer on their own. So their incentive um, around all their cost around Medicare and Medicaid is so large, it dwarfs any um, adverse incentive they might have around getting lobbied because the, just the numbers dwarf. But um, interestingly, it depends on which um, pharma company you talk to, but a lot of them see both risk and opportunity with personalized medicine. So yes, the downside is you're going to take this drug that we've put all this money into and you're going to say, well, don't give it to all 100 people, only give it to 20. But what also happens to the pharma companies all the time is they spend a billion dollars developing a drug and getting it to the public. And nine weeks later, it has to be pulled from the market because 2% of the population, or a half a percent of the population, have some terrible adverse effect. Vioxx, right? It turns out that Vioxx is a really effective drug. There are people that are still mad because we took away their Vioxx. But there's a small number of patients who have accelerated heart disease when they take Vioxx. If we could say, look, Vioxx is fine, unless you're one of these 10 people that can't have it, Vioxx would be back on the market, and Merck would still be recovering revenues from Vioxx, and there are hundreds and hundreds of those drugs. So I don't think the pharma companies are really, really sure from an economic standpoint whether this is a win or a lose, and they're watching. And they are participating. And if almost every drug company has a, has a pharmacogenomics program where they're trying to look at this with us to try to understand it. It's a great question. Well.